Esther chapter 1. Now in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the provinces were before him, while he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days, 180 days. And when these days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in Susa the citadel, both great and small, a feast lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white cotton curtains and violet hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rods and marble pillars and also couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and precious stones. Drinks were served in golden vessels, vessels of different kinds, and the royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king. And drinking was according to this edict, there is no compulsion. For the king had given orders to all the staff of his palace to do as each man desired. Queen Vashti also gave a feast for the women in the palace that belonged to King Ahasuerus. All right. So this is one of those stories, you know, you watch movies and sometimes we'll introduce a story in a different way. Some people like to introduce a story with a big, long introduction, tells you the history of everybody. And some people like to drop you, this is my favorite, they drop you right in the middle of the action and you just have to kind of catch up and figure out what are, what are we doing and where are we? That's kind of how the book of Esther introduces things. It drops you right into the middle of the setting and says, this is what's going on and kind of gets you caught up in the story. I also like that it says, you know, in the days of the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia, which back then everybody would have said, oh yeah, and to us we're like, which guy? But, um, so just to catch us up a little bit on the background, because this dumps us right into the action. We're in, it says, the days of Ahasuerus. This is a descendant of Cyrus. You guys remember Cyrus, who gave the decree that the Jews could go back after their exile. And then Darius, who administered some of that with, with Nehemiah. This is now Ahasuerus, who is descended from those kings. He's, he, he was also called Xerxes, historically. You might read that name more often. So he was the son of the Darius that we read about in the books of Daniel and Ezra. So the Jews have been taken into captivity, right? They're being punished by their disobedient, for their disobedience to the Lord. But 30 years before what happens in Esther, there's a decree that goes out from the Persian kingdom that says, hey, it's all right if you guys go back to your homeland, you can begin rebuilding your temple. And that's what we read about in the book of Esther, or Ezra, sorry, in Nehemiah. That was 30 years before the events of this book. So some Jews have already left Persia and kind of gone back and begun to try and rebuild the temple and their homes in, uh, in Israel. These Jews that we're reading about in the book of Esther have stayed in Persia. And that's going to become a really important and interesting point. Um, we're going to read as we, as we go. We're going to be introduced to these characters who have stayed. They chose to live among the Gentiles rather than return to their homeland. At this point, Judea and Israel was kind of seen as this rough kind of frontier town, right? Because it had been destroyed. And a lot of people were saying, well, why go back? It's a mess. This is really nice, right? What we just read about seems super great. And so a lot of people were staying there. The time in history that we're at, think of when you read about the, the classical Greeks, right? You read the Iliad or the Odyssey. That's the time period that we're in right now, the height of Greek society and the furthest extent of Persian rule. At, the, at this time, the Persian Empire was the largest empire the world had ever seen. It says that he reigned from India to Ethiopia, right, which is this massive um, area. And when it says that there was 127 provinces, that was how big that their empire was. They had to organize it into these little states, essentially, that they would put a governor over each one because it was too large for one person to administer. So as we keep going, we're going to get introduced to these different characters, and I'll kind of explain some different things about them. But the whole point of the book of Esther is it's a really interesting and fascinating and compelling narrative story explaining a historical point where God's people were getting threatened with total annihilation. They were about to be wiped out. And we're going to watch as God's mercy and providence provides a way of salvation for them when it looks like there's no hope for them. And we're going to watch how God uses individual people to be part of that. God, what's really interesting about the book of Esther is you're not going to see God's name actually get mentioned in the book of Esther at all. To my understanding, it's the only book of the Bible that's like that. But you're going to see God act all throughout the book of Esther. There's going to be all kinds of points where as we read, you're going to say, well, why would that happen? That's weird. And you're going to see that God is using his people to take care of his promise to fulfill his covenant to them, um, even in ways that maybe they might not have noticed or known at the time. So, all right, that's our background. Now we're going to jump in from verse one. Now, this is a, like I said, this is a narrative and you can kind of see that 
there, there's a lot of people who argue that it's possible Esther was actually written by an eyewitness, maybe even Mordecai, because there's a lot of details in this story that we're going to read that if you go and check in contemporary history, make it clear that this person knew who the Persians were. This wasn't a person who was writing years and years later and he's kind of guessing or making, you know, getting facts from somebody else. He's giving a lot of details that seem like it would only be a person who had actually been present and known what Persian culture is like, um, which would make sense if it came from Mordecai or somebody like that. So he introduces us right away to Ahasuerus or Xerxes, uh, Xerxes styled himself the king of kings. That's how he was known <laughs> in his day. Uh, he was a cruel and brutal despot. He had more power probably than anybody else had ever had at that time in the world. And he had an unimaginably wealthy empire. So we get set into this, this setting. We're going to have this tale, right, of treachery and plotting and rescues. And so you get in this really exotic, weird setting. Remember, this book is being written for Jews, and as they read this, this is not what Jewish culture or, or Jewish history was like. So it's kind of like when we read some story about some other place that we've never been, and it's got all these interesting details, that's what it would have been like for them as well. We're going to read about people who are cruel, and there's going to be constant danger and paranoia and secrets and all that stuff. And even from this beginning scene, this banquet is supposed to shock us when we read it with how over the top and kind of ridiculous it is, right? When you read these details, and we're going to see this a lot in Esther, the book of Esther has a lot of humor in it. If you read something and you're kind of like, oh, that's kind of funny, it's, it's probably intended to make you laugh. Um, so be aware of that as we read. One of the things that's kind of humorous is he's going to begin explaining this banquet, and he paints it as this crazy over the top scene, and you're supposed to kind of be laughing at these people. Because you're reading and they're like, this is the king of kings. And what does he do to, to show how, how powerful he is? Well, he throws a massive party for half a year and everybody gets really drunk. And you're supposed to laugh. You're like, man, these guys are ridiculous. And that's the point. It's showing you how, look at this person who has all this power. This is what he's choosing to do with it. And then it's going to show you how, the peop how God's people act and the contrast between those. So I'd like to, we've got a couple of slides here. Holland, if you could just go to the first slide. Um, this is a picture of, that's the current capital of Susa that they've excavated. This is in modern day Iran. And this is the archaeological site. This is all verified. You can find inscriptions that talk about Xerxes and the different kings who ruled here. Um, I don't know exactly which building it is. I think it's the one that looks like it's surrounded kind of by pillars over to the right. Is actually supposed to be Xerxes' capital building, his court, where this would have actually happened. So we have a lot of archaeological documentation of this. If you go to the next slide, that's kind of a similar view of it. Um, and so you can even see from these, again, this is all kind of torn down and has been excavated, but this is a major, major building and a major empire. We kind of look at it and we say, wow, that's, that's excellent. But imagine what it would have been like if most of your life you lived, you know, remember there's a seven day period where he brings in all the people in the capital. Imagine you live most of your life in a tiny little, you know, mud brick hut and that's your life and you get brought into something like this. This would have been unlike anything you had ever seen before in your life. It would have looked like something unimaginable and that's what it was supposed to be like. It was supposed to give you this sense that the person whose home you were stepping into was a god because that's how they thought of their, their emperors, their leaders. So he's projecting all this power saying, I'm unlike any other person that you've ever seen. So he lays out this mind-boggling spread. If you go to the next slide, this is what we think it actually looked like. It would have been painted, and there would have been these gardens and these fountains, and it would have been this crazy scene that would have so much input for your senses that, again, they didn't really have back then. So you're stepping into a place that's not like anything you've ever seen. They called it a paradise was actually the words that would have been used to describe it. And so we're seeing all this extravagant and kind of decadent culture and then we're going to get introduced to some characters who step into this world and it starts causing a lot of crazy problems for them. Um, one of the notes and the details here is it says as he throws this party, and there's several stages to this party, right? There's a 180-day party. That's just for kind of his, his VIPs, the special people that are in his court. And there's a seven-day party where he literally just throws the door open and says, everybody get on in here and everybody can drink as much as they want. That's an important item that's going to come up later. It's a cultural detail. It helps us know, again, that this is actually somebody who knew about Persian culture. Um, but this is the way that th these things were administered. And think about, so you're Esther and Mordecai, who we're going to get introduced to in a minute. But you guys know who they are. So imagine that you're, you've been pulled from your home. You're living among these Gentiles. You're, you know that you're there because God has punished your people. And this is day one, right, of this seven-day party. And the doors are open. And everybody says, hey, everybody get in here. We're going to all 
see how glorious our king's rule is and how amazing he is and his treasure and his wealth. And you start to witness this scene that starts to happen, right? And kind of think about what that would have been like for them. Maybe as they come in, maybe there's this reminder of just how dark and sinful and messed up this place that they're stuck in really is. They're seeing all these crazy things happen around them and they're like, hey, we don't have any options, right? It's not as if you could say, thank you, King, for this amazing invitation. I think I'll sit this one out. That wasn't an option for you, right? It was a, it was a compelled thing so he could display who he was. So maybe it's, it's kind of almost like it says in the book of Genesis where, you know, or, and then it talks about Lot in Hebrews where his heart was oppressed by what he was seeing, right? Maybe it was like that. Maybe they felt intimidated, right? Your step, and that's what you were supposed to feel. You would step into a building like this and you were supposed to feel like, okay, I'm not in charge and this guy is in charge. I'd better do exactly whatever it is that he wants because he's able to do this, right? He's able to build this and make this happen. Maybe they felt intimidated and helpless. Maybe they were disgusted by all the things that they saw, that the way that people were acting, the way people were behaving, right? And honestly, maybe they were a little bit numb by now. Maybe they had lived, you know, this is for them, this is a place that they've been for years and years. Esther probably grew up mostly in this setting, not in Israel. So maybe they were numb. Maybe they just kind of saw it and said, yeah, this is kind of, you know, how this is. <laughs> this is the world that we live in. Maybe it didn't even have much of an impact on them anymore because of how long they'd been living there and hiding their identity. You know, Jesus in Matthew 20, verse 25 through 26, he called his disciples around and he said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And all through the book of Ex Esther, we're going to see this contrast between here's how the Gentiles lord it over them, right? This is what the world does when they have power. This is the way they behave when they have the ability to say, do this, and people have to do it. And then we're going to see a contrast with, but this is what God's people are supposed to do with our power that the Lord gives us. If we have opportunity, if we have influence, here's what God wants us to do. So you're going to start looking for that contrast between what <laughs> these rulers do and what Esther and Mordecai begin to do when they start to have access to these things. So this is our setting. This is wild party that's happening. And on this, verse 10, it says, on the seventh day, so at the total height of the party, things start to get a little bit uh, out of hand. Verse 10, it says, on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he committed Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abagtha, Zethar, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king, with her royal crown, in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, delivered by the eunuchs. At this, the king became enraged, and his anger burned within him. So I told you we were going to see a pretty interesting story. Um, the king gets drunk at some point. I'm sure this was not the only point. He's been partying for a half a year. So at this point, he was drunk, right? Uh, he starts making prideful and foolish decisions. Now, this is a, this is a historical note that's going to help us understand the rest of this. According to Herodotus, who's an ancient historian and some other historians, um, historically for Persian royalty, the tradition was that they couldn't make state decisions unless they were drunk. This is a great way to administer a massive kingdom with many provinces. Um, so what they would do, and this is, this is, we have historical documentation for this, what they would do is if they had to make an important decision, the king would get drunk, make the decision, and now all of a sudden a lot of things that we're about to read in the book of Esther make a lot more sense, right? And also in the book of Daniel, you start to realize, oh, no wonder they had to write everything down when the king was making decisions because he's not going to remember the next morning. So we're going to write it all down, and then that's the rule. We can't change it. They believed that he was closer to the gods when he was intoxicated, and this is how they did things. So when it says he begins to make these decisions when he's drunk, all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay, that's exactly, that makes a lot more sense. If you see him starting to act irrationally in this book, yeah, it's, there's a reason for that. So there's, and again, I told you, there's going to be humor and satire here in the book of Esther. You're supposed to, as a Jew who's reading this, you're supposed to be like, look at these people, man. These people are ridiculous, right? It's a way of I encouraging and, and the Lord's kind of heartening and, and helping his people say, yeah, I know you're in captivity and I've even caused that to happen, but it's okay to laugh at these people. I, di I didn't say they were right. I didn't say they were good, right? I just said I was allowing them to, to keep you in captivity. It's okay to kind of say, man, this is ridiculous. This is not how it's supposed to be. Proverbs uh, 31, 4 through 5 says, It's not for kings, O Lemuel, it's not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to take strong drink, lest they drink and forget what's been decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. And the Bible makes it clear that 
hey, just because you have the freedom to do something, to enjoy some blessing or enjoy some opportunity you have or use some power that you have, you have a, a mandate from the Lord to do that in a way that's a blessing to you and the people around you. You have to remain in control of yourself. And leaders are supposed to make additional sacrifices so that they can serve well and not take from others and just, you know, again, this whole party that you're seeing, even the way that he's blessing other people, supposedly, it's all to serve his pride, right? And this request that he is making is, again, to serve his pride. Hey, and, and if you're wondering, yeah, we should read all the things into that that you're probably reading into it. This was an indecent request he's making of his queen to come and show herself off at this drunken party to prove his ability, to prove his, you know, how, um, here's how amazing of a king I am. Everybody look at this, right? It's a really gross thing that's going on. This is not the way we ought to act or the way that leaders ought to act, but we see in Scripture many, many examples of terrible leaders and rulers. That's almost a theme in the Bible. You read all these guys and you're like, these are the people that were in charge, but that shouldn't surprise us, right? There's also a constant theme of God's people flourishing anyway, right? We read this all throughout Scripture. Hey, this, there's this terrible leader, and look what God's people were able to do. This horrible thing happened because of this king, but look what the Lord did, right? And we're going to see that through the book of Esther, too. we got to make sure, just as in their day, there was this challenge to look at that guy and say, okay, well, what are we supposed to do? This guy's in charge. What are we going to do, right? Look at him. He, he can do whatever he wants. He can make these crazy requests while he's drunk, and we all have to obey him. We're just stuck. We can't do anything. But that's not the way that God wants us to see the situation. So Xerxes sends his advisors. These are seven important uh, eunuchs, which they're, they're specifically men that are brought into his court and kept as these kind of like advisors who would have his ear. Um, these guys, as to my understanding, are actually confirmed also in extra biblical sources. Uh, whenever I say that, I'm not saying that we shouldn't believe it unless we see it somewhere else. I'm saying that when people come to you and try and tell you, see, all this stuff is made up. That's not true because we have all this other confirmation, right? So we, we know about these characters that basically would be hanging out in the king's court. And you can imagine like from Lord of the Rings, you know, Grima, the guy who's kind of whispering into the king's ear, right? Or in Star Wars, right? The Jabba the Hutt's palace. And there's all these people around hanging out trying to see what they can get. That's exactly who these kind of guys were. They were really, you know, these strange people that would be hanging out trying to manipulate. And especially in the Persian court, this would happen all the time. We're going to see these plots start to happen where anybody that was close to the king would try and maneuver keep themselves safe, and then use the king's power to get other people that they didn't like. And that's exactly what's about to happen. The king gets drunk. He commands these guys, go bring my queen. They go say, hey, you're supposed to show up. And Queen Vashti refuses. You know that it's a total debauch when the Persian queen, right, who's a Gentile, is like, yeah, that's too much of a party. I'm not going to come. Right? That's how insane things were getting. And she says, no, I'm, I'm not going to do it. So the king's wrath burns, and now he starts to make some really uh, prideful and interesting decisions. Verse 13, Then the king said to the wise men who knew the times, for this was the king's procedure toward all who were versed in law and judgment, the men next to him being Karshina, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Meres, Marcina, and Memucan, the seven princes of Persia and Media, who saw the king's face and sat first in the kingdom. According to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti because she has not performed the command of King Ahasuerus delivered by the eunuchs? I'm just going to pause. You can see there's a style to things, right? Like there's a flow to the language where it'll say, hey, here's the seven eunuchs the king had and here's what they said. And it lists them all out and there's this kind of almost flow to the language. It's, again, these, when I was reading and studying for Esther, people would say things like, well, we know that this is a fairy tale because of look how like the, the story is all neat and it's all put together nicely. And I was like, so clearly you never had a good history teacher in high school because what you should know about teaching people history is if you want people to remember something, you put the history together in a very good order so that people will remember it, right? And this book was written to be orally retold to the Jews so that they could remember the history of what God had done. So yeah, it makes sense that God inspires it to the Holy Spirit to somebody who is able to lay it out in a way that people could remember. Sometimes, you know, like Tyler says, have a little imagination, just try. So the, it's listing these different people, and it's kind of unfolding the story. So the king gets upset, and he goes to this next group of people. These would be the advisors, right? Some different kind of role that they'd have about the law. And he asks them, so what are we supposed to do according to the law? Verse 16, then Memucan said, in the presence of the king and the officials, not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all the peoples who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt. 
since they will say, King Ahasuerus has commanded Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the noble women of Persia and Media, who have heard of the queen's behavior, will say the same to all the king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath in plenty. If it please the king, let a royal order go out from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it may not be repealed, that Vashti is never again to come before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give a royal position to another who is better than she. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all his kingdom, for it is vast, all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. All right, so if this sounds like flattery, it's flattery. <laughs> this guy is really going over the top, right? Remember, everybody's drunk. Anybody that you're reading about in this story that's talking, drunk. So all these drunk guys are together, and the king says, what am I going to do with my queen? She won't come out here. And this guy says, listen, dude, not only did she mess up against you, he, she messed up against the entire kingdom, and here's what you should do. Since you're so great, you should get rid of her and get another one. She'll be way better. She's, it's okay, man. You didn't deserve, you know, she didn't deserve you anyway, right? That's what they're all doing. They're trying to you know, massage this guy's pride and his little weak ego because they know that that's what they need to do to keep their position that they have. So he, the, these guys are inserting this idea that, okay, well, let's get rid of her, and then we'll bring some other queen, and, and that'll be better for you, because we don't all want to look weak, right? Proverbs 19.12 says, The king's wrath is like the roaring of a lion, but his favor is like dew on the grass. And this is what we're going to see throughout this book, is these impulsive, ridiculous decisions these people make that our, our heroes, kind of in the story, have no control over. It's almost like, it's like when you go outside and the weather happens, right? You, you, you just like, well, here we are. Now it's raining, right? That's kind of what w the world that they're stepping into. These crazy things can happen at any time, and they really don't have a lot of control over that. And we're going to see that the Bible isn't a political manual. It doesn't give us instructions on how to manipulate and maneuver in these situations to get control or get power. But it does tell us how to behave when the rulers of this world do cause us suffering. When there are impulsive actions, when there are things that happen that cause pain and chaos and stuff that are outside of our control. And one of the best things that it tells us is, hey, we don't despair. We were talking about this last week, right? How they're saying, hey, that's not us. We don't look at the world and say, well, I guess it's all over. Let's just sit inside our house and wait for Jesus to come back, right? And one of the reasons why we don't do that is we have a Bible filled with examples when it was way worse. Like, I don't even know, I don't really care about your political affiliation. It's not this bad, <laughs> right? At the very least, the way we make decisions in America isn't, well, first, let's get everybody drunk, right? <laughs> That's, so we, we can look at this situation and say, okay, the Lord came through here, right? If the Lord is powerful enough to make something happen in this situation, I'm pretty sure the Lord's able to handle a dual legislature and some judiciary, right? Like, I think God's got that covered because he's been able to work in situations that are as outlandish as this. So it is supposed to encourage us. So the king is making these decisions. He gets these advisors and they come and say, well, let's just get rid of her and make a decree, you know, that, hey, you can't do this because it's making all of us guys look bad. Uh, and the, the humor continues. Verse 21, this advice pleased the king and the princes, and the king did as Memucan proposed. He sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province in its own script, and to every people in its own language, that every man be master in his own household and speak according to the language of his people. So this is how you know that you're a really very powerful um, king is when <laughs> you order your queen to do something indecent and she says, no, I'm not going to do it. Rather than, you know, he can't make, he literally is demonstrating to the entire province, well, I can't make her do anything, but hey, we're all still in charge in our houses, just so you know. And he makes a law because that's how, you know, he uh, is clearly feeling a little bit of pride here and, and spurned pride. So he gets angry. He writes this letter. He says, no, listen, all the husbands are in charge, even though Queen Vashti didn't come. And then, oh, by the way, what's my order? Uh, she can't come to the palace anymore. Right. She didn't. She said she wasn't going to come. Yeah, she can't. OK. Right. <laughs> Who's really in charge here? Right. And I think that's why he's making these orders. He's, he's like, well, I've got to make it look like I'm still really in charge. So he gives an order that she has to do the thing that she decided she was going to do. Um, all right, bud, you're in charge. So the scene is set, right? We've got this powerful, capricious king who makes these snap decisions on a drunken hair trigger. Oh, and if you mess up and, and he doesn't like what you did, you're going to suffer serious consequences, right? She gets banished, right? She's in this position of power and authority. Queens in Persia were seen as these kind of manipulative. They were very important because they had this access to the king. So she had a really good setup. And now because she chooses not to obey this decision, she's totally removed from that and, and would have lost this huge, you know, she was safe, in a sense, in the, in the palace. That's not going to be true anymore. 
So we know that this is this guy. If you mess up, he's going to make a law, send it out to all the, you know, the land, explain to everybody that this is what he does to people he doesn't like, and then you're going to pay the price of it. So the, the stakes are kind of raised and set here, and then we're going to get introduced to our main characters. So in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who had attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa the citadel under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who's in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given them, and let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king, and he did so. All right. Now, historically, this isn't something that happened immediately. When it says, after these things, we believe that there's about a four-year gap here in between when he banishes Vashti and when he decides that he needs a new queen. What does he do in between? Uh, we actually have some historical documentation. Uh, this 180-day you know, rager that he'd been throwing for everybody was supposed to be a military planning meeting. How that was going, I don't know. But supposedly what he was doing is gathering all these nobles and these officials that were planning this military expedition to go conquer Greece. Predictably, it didn't go very well <laughs> because that's, you're not supposed to have a planning meeting like that. So he goes, he tries to conquer Greece, and there's two famous battles, a naval battle at Salamis and a land battle at Plataea. Uh, there, the Persians get completely whooped in both battles, uh, which was a major underdog thing. P Persia, again, huge, massive empire, Greece, tiny collection of city-states, and he thinks he's just going to go and roll over them, and that's ex not what happens at all. In fact, there's a, we don't know if it's true or not, but there's a historical legend that he basically, at Salamis, he, it, he's able to overlook this entire naval battle. So he sets up his throne and basically sets up like stands where he's just going to watch his army go out and destroy this, this uh, Greek navy. And he gets a ringside seat to see his entire navy get destroyed. And he was super upset about it. He was like, you know, he, he's a funny character in history because he just he does, he makes these decisions. They go against him, and he just gets furious, and he starts punishing people around him. There's another story where he, something went wrong, and he, there was some river or something they were trying to cross. Something went wrong, and he told all of his advisors to go get whips and chains and like whip the water to punish it because I'm in charge for real. This is the guy, right? <laughs> At least he's consistent. Um, so now he spent four years on this military expedition. He finally makes it back to Persia. He's furious. He's got all this hurt pride in front of the whole world. He said, I'm going to go out and do this. And he's got to come back with no army and no navy. And then he remembers, oh, right, and I don't have a queen anymore because I made that one decision. So at this point, all of his advisors seeing that, okay, the king's super upset and we need to do something to make the king happy because what's he do when he gets angry? Some of us die, so let's, let's fix that. So they say, listen, we need to get you a new queen, so here's what we're going to do. And they introduce this plan to him. Now, you know, Esther is a really good story, and so we get all these popular versions of it that you might be familiar with, you know, like the VeggieTales one and some other ones. Which are great, and I love. But the problem with those is that the real story is not exactly like the flannel, flannel graph version. Um, there's a lot of adult material in here, which I'm sure you're seeing. Um, but that's important because it shows us how crazy and dangerous this situation was and how difficult it was for God's people to be in this situation. So don't, all this stuff we're reading, it should be obvious, this, but this is not like some romantic story. This is not like a, you know, a reality dating show where he's going to come and line up all the ladies and I'll pick one. That's not how this is working. This is just as gross and awful as it sounds. Because he's the king, he just says, well, find all the beautiful ones, and I'll pick the one that I like by sleeping with all of them. And then w when he completes that, by the way, they all, the ones that he does not choose, and we're going to read, they just get sent into his harem where they live as widows for the rest of their life. They don't, like, go back to their family. Like, they're just stuck now. They live in the palace. They have this beautiful life, but it's like a cage where they can't see anybody that they know, and they're, they're going to stay there forever unless he decides that he's going to bring them back again. So it's a really horrible situation, and nobody involved here gets a say, right? It's, the families are le losing their daughters to the king. They don't get to say, well, you know, in this case, maybe can you make an exception? No, he's the king. He does what he wants. He's already demonstrated that, right? So, yeah, this is a really awful situation. And the Bible is full of stories like this. People who get placed in these terrible, desperate circumstances, and the only choice they have is to trust God because they don't have any opportunity. They don't have any control over their own situation. 
it's really important that we don't believe this lie, and this has been consistent forever, but the enemy tells this lie, especially now, that, oh yeah, you, you Christians, I, I get it. You, you, know, you have this nice story that you believe because it's really hard to face how hard the world is out there. And so you go in this, you know, you show up every Sunday and you tell each other this nice story about how it's all going to be okay because you really can't face the reality of the world. I mean, have you, that's cool, but if you re actually read the Bible, <laughs> you realize that in a lot of ways, Christians are the only ones that are able to face the world the way it really is, because we know who Jesus is. We all are looking at the same world, right? The Bible's filled with these stories of how the world is pretty awful, actually. It's really serious, and, and you read Ecclesiastes, you read Esther, you read all the story of what's happened to God's people. We understand how the world is. We just know who God is, too. Right? That's the only thing that makes it different. So it's really important that when we tell these stories to each other, we remind each other of the real details, right? I'm, I don't, we want to be kind and, and we want to be appropriate, but we also want to, hey, this is how it was. It wasn't some sort of like nice version of the story. It was a really intense situation, and we're about to see how it was so bad that in some ways God's people were having to compromise and make these decisions that the book doesn't even tell you how to think about it. It just lays them out there and says, this is how it was. They were people just like us. Sometimes they made mistakes in the difficulty of the situation they were in. But God was there doing what God was going to do, no matter what the enemy was doing, and even sometimes no matter how well God's people were doing in the middle of the situation. So this is what's about to happen. The king's rounding up all of these young women, and he's going to declare his new queen. So beginning in verse 5, it says, Now there was a Jew in Susha the citadel whose name was Mordecai, the son of Yer, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives carried away when Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, uh, with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in the Susa, uh, in Susa the citadel in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. So that's all our background. It dumps us into the setting. It gives us all these details and this flavor. And now we get introduced to the people that we're going to follow through the story. There's two Jews who are really close to the center of power. Mordecai lives in Susa. We're going to find out that he's got this kind of lower government position originally. And his, this woman that he's bringing up as his daughter, it says, but she's actually the daughter of his uncle. And so again, remember, why are they here? Well, they could have gone back to Israel, but they stayed in Persia. And we're going to see this throughout, you know, Esther. It's not telling us what to think about that. It's just saying, hey, this is what happened. This is what these people did. We're kind of having to draw our own conclusions. It's not saying and that was a bad thing to do or that was a good thing to do. It's saying this is where we are. This is where these people are. This is the situation that they're in. Um, Mordecai is specifically labeled as a descendant of Kish, and so that means he's from the family of Saul. Hang on to that. It's not going to be important this week, but it's definitely going to come back. It's going to be super important at some point. So it's giving us this foreshadowing that, hey, keep in mind, this guy is descended from, from Saul of Israel. And it says that he was carried away. He, we, of course, would be older. He was carried away, actually part of the exile. So he would have remembered that. And then his, um, or rather, I'm sorry, it says that he was the, his, his family would, at the very least, he would have, he would have had been close to that. And then this younger woman that he's taking care of is an orphan. And it doesn't, again, say exactly how old we were presuming she's young. It says they're collecting the young virgins. So she may, this may be the only world she remembers. In either, in either case, both of them are kind of strangers in a, in a strange land, right? They're stuck. And what also we're going to find out really quickly is nobody knows that they're Jews, which means that they've been kind of hiding out. And, and they've been handling their situation differently than we've seen other Jews handle the exact same situation in Persia, right? You read the book of Daniel and these young guys that get pulled from their home and they're going to be made these like basically court hanger on. They're going to be left in the court to kind of be the, 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 the examples of, look, we collect all the best and brightest from the whole world into our, into our little, you know, model empire. And we, we show them off basically. Those young guys made some really courageous decisions. They said, okay, 
I have to be here, but I don't have to eat like you. I don't have to act like you. I'm going to still be a Jew here. That was the decision they made, right? And that got them in a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, but that's what they chose to do. That's not what Esther and Mordecai are doing. If no one knows they're a Jew, what does that mean? It means they're dressing like Persians, they're eating like Persians, they're acting like Persians. They're breaking God's law constantly in doing that. Now, again, it doesn't tell us what to think about that. It doesn't give us a story that says, hey, and this is why they had to do that. It was to save their lives, and so it's okay. It just says, hey, just so you know, nobody knew that they were Jews because they weren't acting like God's people. They were just fitting right in. So that's important for us to see. They're stranded. They're lonely. Esther doesn't have her parents. They're kind of huddled together in this like kind of makeshift family taking care of each other, right? So we look at this and we say, well, that's trouble. Like, they're, no, who's going to come to save them? Well, God's not concerned about it. God's not worried. God is about to put them in exactly the place where God wants them to be to do the work that God wants them to do. Isaiah 49, 22 through 23 says, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and raise my signal to the peoples, and they shall bring your sons in their arms, and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers, and their queens your nursing mothers. With their faces to the ground, they shall bow down to you and lick the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. And remember, that's, you know, Isaiah is saying, hey, we're going to get judged. And here's what the Lord's going to do anyway, right? We always have to keep this in mind as Christians that when we look at these situations, and this situation looked pretty bad, right? They've, they've hidden out, they've done their best, and it still wasn't good enough to stay off of the king's radar. This would have been, can you imagine the anxiety, right? You go up and you, I don't know how this stuff gets announced, but you realize, oh, this is the new thing he's doing this week. Like, can you imagine how intense that situation is for them? But we have to be, we have to remember that these are the things that the Lord's promised us, that he puts us in these situations, he knows what he's doing, and he's doing that for a reason. It may not be clear to us at the time, I'm sure it wasn't clear to them right now in the story, but there is a reason for it, and he's asking us to act in the situations he's placing us in, in order to glorify him, and in order to carry out a plan that he has. And that's what we're going to see as the story unfolds. So, she gets collected kind of with this whole collection and these women are brought into the court. They're going to be kept, it says, um, for a, a period of time. We'll talk about the reason why. So basically she, she shows up with all these other ladies. And then in verse 9, the young woman, that's Esther, pleased him. That's the, the guy who's in charge of this whole process and won his favor. And he quickly provided her with cosmetics and her portion of food and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace, and advanced her and her young woman to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. Now when the turn came for each young woman to go into King Ahasuerus, after being twelve months under the regulations for the women, since this was the regular period of their beautifying, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and ointments for women, when the young woman went into the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening she would go in, and in the morning she would return to the second harem in custody of Shashgaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her, and she was summoned by name. When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter to go into the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. All right. So she shows up. She doesn't have a choice that she's here. And we start to see this pattern. Well, no matter where she goes, the people who see her say, this person's special. I'm going to do a little something extra for her. I'm gonna, you know, I have the ability to, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm in charge of this whole process, and I can kind of tilt the scales a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Why don't, I give, why don't I give you this extra special thing or put you in this position? And these things all start to happen, right? Not because she's, from what we can see, not because she's maneuvering or trying to do anything particular, but because the Lord is making this path for her because the Lord is going to do what he wants to do. The Lord knows what he's doing and the plan that he has. Her beauty and her grace are charming the people around her, and they want to give her this prime place. Now, it talks about that there's multiple reasons for this, right? It already said, hey, this was a beautiful woman. Well, it makes that really clear, right? This is a person that when the, this guy wants to please the king, and he says, okay, I'm going to have to, let's do good. Which ones are we going to send in first? Well, that one looks beautiful. So her outward beauty is a part of this, and we don't want to downplay that. The Lord, you know, we say VeggieTales, God made you special and he loves you very much. Well, it's true, right? The Lord makes each of us uniquely, and it wasn't just her outward beauty. It was clearly something inward about her because there's a personality element to this too. It says that she was, she was finding favor with people. They were spending time with her, and the way that she was carrying herself, 
made her the kind of woman that people noticed. And they said, okay, this is, if I want to get favor with the king, I'm going to make sure that this person gets access and, and is, is presented so that he is pleased with me at the job that I've done. So a couple of things that we can learn from this. Number one, just as a side note, um, we've talked a lot in the, in, recently about God's model for masculinity and femininity. And we talked about how sometimes the world shows those as like these one note things. And that's not how it's supposed to be. We've talked about God's model for masculinity. Look at God's model for femininity. It includes beauty and grace and all these things, but it also includes a woman who's able to go into this, you know, lion's pit, basically, and is able to come out carrying herself in a way that people say, man, that's a strong girl. We better, uh, we better make sure that she gets taken care of, right? So there's, it's, a, it's a well-rounded thing. It's just like masculinity. You get David, who's out there warring people and stuff, and then he's writing these songs and crying over the Lord, and it's, it's not just one thing, right? Obeying God makes us more individual. It doesn't make us less individual, right? That's the lie that the world wants to say. Oh, that's cool. So you're a, you're a Christian, so I guess you have to act like that. No, I'm a Christian, so that means that God made me uniquely, and he wants to m make me into the image, the creation that he wanted me to be. He wants to get rid of the things that the enemy is trying to do that are keeping me from glorifying him in the unique way that he wanted me to glorify him, right? And that should be carried out as, as men, as women, in different ways, but it's not all a one-note thing, right? It's the world that makes people one note and bland. You ever notice that? Out in the world, people just kind of fall into these categories and they do the thing that they're supposed to do. And you, you meet Christians, and I remember C.S. Lewis talks about that, is that you meet saints and they're all just themselves. You ever meet somebody who's been walking with the Lord for 50 years and you're like, I have never met a person like you. Like, you are, you are pretty different, right? And in, in, in ways that are excellent and encourage other people, and then sometimes there's like a little quirk about them too that just makes them themselves, you know? But that's what the Lord does in our hearts. He makes us people that people notice. What, for our glory, not at all. But because the Lord knows he's sending us into these situations where it's not going to be good enough to just be, well, I guess I'm just me. I don't know what's going to happen. You need to be a person that people around you are going to take notice of because you may be called on to do some things where people are going to have to take notice of you and pay attention to you. Not, not to glorify you, but for the Lord's glory. So God's not making these one-note people. He's making symphonies, right? He's making works of art that are capable of facing the good works that he's preparing for us. The Lord knows, he's like, okay, I'm going to send her in here. Oh, that's going to be crazy. I better make sure, right, that she's ready for it, that she's prepared for it. And he's been doing that through this whole process of her hiding out and hiding who she was and listening to Mordecai's, you know, judgment and instruction. The Lord's been preparing her for what's about to happen. Just because God's name isn't mentioned in the book, right? It doesn't mean that he's not present in the whole book. God's in control and he's at work in these events. God was, you know, God's plan was taking hold. Even as Esther was going into a situation that I don't think any of us would have said, this seems good, right? This is fine, right? Taken into the king's palace to be a concubine. This is excellent. No, it's not good at all. But that doesn't matter to the Lord. God knows what plan he's got. So, we start to see these things happen. She goes into this situation and the guy who's in charge of her, who could have decided, you know what? I don't, I don't like the look of her. Let's, let's make sure that she doesn't look good for the king. I, I like this other one. I'm going to favor this. That's not what he did. The Lord turned his heart. And of course it was the Lord, right? That's not just a chance because it keeps happening over and over. You know, this is hard for us sometimes, but don't we believe that every single thing that comes to us passes through the hand of God? Right? Is that true or not? Right? And if that's true, it has to be true everywhere. It has to be true the hard things that happen to us, the things that another person does to us, right? Where somebody did something evil and I wound up holding the bag. Well, didn't the Lord know that too? Right? When the Lord blesses us, we're like, oh, thank you, Lord. But then when something hard happens and we can see the person that did it, it's kind of hard to remember that, right? But that's what Esther's experiencing. The good things that happen, where, hey, this guy gave me this, advanced me a little bit. The things that happen where it's like, hey, this king got drunk and now I'm having to show up at the palace. All those things are coming to her through the hand of God. The Lord is preparing her way and maneuvering her through all this. Now, her preparation continues for a year where she's waiting to find out if she's going to spend the rest of her life a widow in the king's harem or if she's going to get pulled even deeper into the whole mess and intrigue, right? I don't think either of these are good. What happened to the last queen? Eh, it wasn't good, but, <laughs> you know, right, that's, that's what is happening. She's got this terrible dilemma that she's getting pulled into. So verse 16, And when Esther was taken into King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. 
Then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes in the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. Now, when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Esther had not made it known her kindred or her people as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. So, the king is also charmed by Esther. The king names her his queen. He throws another feast because apparently that's just what he does. Pretty much at any time, he just throws another massive feast. Says he gives everybody a tax break because I guess that's also what he does. Everybody's like, great, this is Esther's tax credit. Wonderful, thank you, right? So he's, he's, basically, he's throwing this huge party to commemorate the fact that now he has this new queen. Esther's being blessed because of her actions, right? But she's also being blessed in, in some ways in spite of them. Remember, what she's doing here, it's not telling us how we're supposed to feel about this. And we should feel a little bit weird about some of this. There's some, there's some difficult things going on here. She has been con she's still concealing her true identity as a Jew, even after being brought into the king's court, even after being made the queen. That means that she's acting like a Gentile, living like a Gentile. She's breaking the Jewish ceremonial law. And now she's gone to this final straw of she's slept with the king. She's gotten married to a Gentile. And she's part of a huge polygamous relationship where this guy has all these other women in the harem, right? None of this is a good thing. It's not godly. It's not what, you know, the law said how Jews should act. And I don't think we're supposed to necessarily, when we read it, I don't think we're being given this moral instruction of, and that's what you're supposed to do, right? I think we're getting told, hey, sometimes you get put in some situations and you might make some mistakes, you know, honestly, I could read it one way and I could say, you know what, Esther probably should have just said, no, I'm not going to do that. Nope, right? What happened when, when Daniel and, and his, his friends, when they all said, no, nah, man, king, we're not going to worship the, the, the statue. It's just not going to happen, right? We're going to throw you into the fire. Okay, <laughs> right? That's, that's how they responded and the Lord saved them out of that. So maybe that's what the Lord would have done. Or maybe this is exactly what she's supposed to do because the Lord is setting her up in this situation to be the queen and there's going to be this huge thing the Lord does through that we're not really necessarily told which of those is the right answer. We're told that God works through all these situations. Hey, maybe she made a huge mistake. That didn't throw God's plan off. God was like, okay, I can work with that. Hey, you made a mistake. I'm, I'm going to give you grace and you're going to, you know, do you think she wasn't eaten up inside about how this whole thing was going? You think Mordecai literally says Mordecai is like going to the harem every day and he's standing at the bottom. Maybe he's like throwing a pebble up and like, hey, what, how's it going? You know, like he's getting eaten up with anxiety because he now has no control over the situation anymore at all. So they're suffering with this whole thing, but the Lord is working. The Lord knows what's going on. Esther, in this situation at this point, is doing what she can to survive. And God is being faithful, even when his people are far from him, right? Not supposed to be here. <laughs> Not supposed to be in this situation. You ever get in one of those places where you're like, ah, I'm in this mess because of a thing I did. I wasn't even really supposed to be here, and now I'm in a mess. That's, where, that's what this is. But even though God's people are far from him, God is still making a way for him. When we feel like all of our circumstances are against us, we have to commit ourselves to looking for the Lord to make a way. And then we have to act like he will by taking some steps in faith, right? Esther, you know, it's making clear, hey, there's some things she's doing here where she's like, all right, I'm going to do this. And I sure hope that the Lord is in this because I don't know what's going to happen, right? And we're going to continue to see that. You know, we tend to do one or the other, right? In our, in our walk with the Lord. We tend, some of us are the kind of person that says, I am going to sit here and wait until something happens. I can tend to be that person. I'm going to wait until the Lord makes it clear. And the Lord's like, remember when you prayed for six months and you felt like the same thing the whole time? And, yep, but I'm waiting for the Lord to make it clear, right? And some of us are the other person. We're the action people. I'm going to go and I hope the Lord blesses it, right? And, and we, can, we can struggle, but the Lord wants us to do both things. There are circumstances where the Lord says, hold up, don't do anything right now. I want you to stay right here until I fix this. And there are some times where the Lord says, what are you waiting for? You, you can see what should be done. You, you have my spirit. You see what's going on do something, right? You, you know what you should do. And the only way that we can tell the difference between those is through the Lord's Holy Spirit. Because we, we can make mistakes on both sides, right? Depending on the kind of person we are or how we feel about the situation. But the Lord uses both of those things. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, for it's the gift of God. So some of us sometimes say, hey, it's the Lord's grace. Like, it's not your own doing, so don't do anything. Well, hang on. Verse 9, not a result of works so that no one may boast. See, it's not works. So I don't do it. I, I'm just, I'm sitting, hang on. For we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
So it is both, right? It's the Lord's grace protects us and he keeps us through these situations, whether we made the mess or somebody else made the mess, but he's preserving us for good works. He's putting us in a position where we're going to see through the Holy Spirit, hey, this should be done. And the Lord says, yep, you're right. Look, look how I set this whole thing up for you. And you couldn't have done that. You couldn't have strategized and planned. But now here you are. And now I want you to act on it. I want you to step out and see what I'm going to do through you, not just kind of around you, right? And so it is both things that we're doing. So here she is. Things have gone from bad to worse to worse, right? Now she's the queen. <laughs> so she could have just gone through with everything, done what she was supposed to do, and then at least she's going to be safe. You know, hey, she's in the palace and I can't see her anymore, but nothing bad's happening to her, right? That's not the Lord's plan. She gets pulled even deeper into the whole circle. And starting in verse uh, 21, you remember she's paying attention to Mordecai. She's doing what Mordecai tells her to do. That's going to be important in a second. In those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Big Than and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther. And Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows. And it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. I love how... This is just a good, this is just a well-told story. You get to the point where you're like, okay, maybe she's all right, right? Because, okay, she's in the court and it's going to be fine. And then the stakes get cranked up. It says, hey, what happens in the king's court? Here's what happens in the king's court. Uh, it's this place where everybody's plotting against everybody. And as soon as the plot gets found out, you get hanged. And we think hanged. So like on a, no, <laughs> that would be nice. This is not what this is. Historically, uh, when they talk about hanged, the, the literal uh, language talks about impaled. So these are people who are getting skewered out on a stick in front of everybody to show everybody, hey, guess what? This is what happens when we find out that you're plotting against the king. Why did they have to go so extremely? Because there were plots against Persian kings constantly. They would get assassinated, and then someone else would move, maneuver into the situation. And, and the closer you were in, in the, the, the king's court, the better access you had to him to do this. So the king had to come down hard as soon as this came out because he's having to show everybody, hey, don't get ideas. This is what happens when this, when this goes on. So this would have been a notoriously, the Persians were notoriously cruel, vicious people in the way they tortured people. Um, there's stuff that I read for this that I'm not even going to explain <laughs> because they were just awful, awful people. They were ingenious in the way they would hurt people to make this display of their power. And assassinations were common. The stakes are getting raised. Now Esther and Mordecai are constantly looking over their shoulders, right? Like, okay, well, who's going to be next? And here's the thing that I never really thought about. Think about the temptation. Mordecai finds out, all right, these two guards are out here. They're, they're talking about, you know, they're talking about getting rid of the king. You can't, you got to remember, these are flawed people. Think about how tempting that is. Well, I know Esther. Esther has access to the king. If I throw in with these guys and we get rid of the, the king, what's going to happen? Well, Esther's going to be in position to either be maneuvered into power or she's going to be able to have access to power. Maybe that's, maybe that's God's plan. We, we kill the king. Is that good? No, but here's what's going to happen. We're going to get this access and then I'm going to be able to protect the Jews from this position of power. Maybe that's the right thing, right? Think of how easy that would have been for him to just not say anything and let it happen and then see if maybe the dice will roll and we'll get something good out of it. That would have been super tempting for him to play. Hey, this is how the game's played, man. It's the Persian court. People just die. So, hey, this is how it is. You know, we're just, he could have played that game and tried to, to use intrigue and treachery. And I'm sure he was afraid and thinking, well, this will give us some security. I'll just, I'll just act like this. He could have rationalized that as an opportunity from God. But that's not the way God's plan gets accomplished, y'all. Yeah, there, do we have opportunities all the time to do what seems like God's plan in our own way? We, we do. And sometimes we take those and they end up being a very bad idea for us. Why? Because God's plan has to get accomplished in God's way. If God puts an opportunity in front of you, do you think he's going to, the Bible says, hey, I've started this in the spirit. Am I going to finish it in the flesh? Hey, uh, the Lord wanted to make this wonderful opportunity to bless my family by cheating on my taxes. Mm. <laughs> Is that really how the Lord's going to accomplish? He started out your family in the spirit and now he's going to finish it off by providing for you through treachery and, and stealing? I don't think so. 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17 it's a bit of a longer passage, but it applies to so much that we're talking about today. It says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, Honor the emperor. 
So that was Peter, right, who's, again, in a time where the kings and the leaders were pretty bad, <laughs> right, is saying, hey, here's how we're going to live. We're going to live as free men. Well, what do you mean we're free men? Hey, dude, I'm actually a slave right now, right? There would have been people who would have heard that who would have been a little offended and said, Peter, I am not free. <laughs> I am a slave, right? Or, okay, yeah, I'm technically free, but it's the Roman Empire. I can't do whatever I want, right? I don't have freedom. That's not how the Lord sees it. Peter says, hey, yeah, this is the king, and this is the system, and this is the, the kingdom, but who's, who is the king of kings, right? We've been seeing all this about, like, you know, I'm going to enter into the Lord's courts, right? They're in the court of the king of kings, but whose court are they really in? They're in the Lord's court, and the Lord is making the decisions, and they're relying on the Lord to save them. They're relying on the Lord to protect them and to keep them safe and to help them when they're making mistakes, and they're like, Lord, I don't even know what to do. They're looking to the Lord for that. And so they are able to live as free, even when they're in the middle of all these awful things that are happening. And when anybody looking outside their situation would have said, you're not free, you've got all these people controlling you. Well, that's not how the Lord sees it. They had to walk step by step in faith. I'm sure at this point, they were able to think about like one hour ahead. You ever get that place in your life where you're like, I literally, I'm going to think about what's going to happen today. Because if I start thinking about tomorrow, I'm going to worry myself sick. And that's where they're at. They're like, literally like, okay, here we go. <laughs> like, I don't know what's going to happen. Today, we're going to not be complicit in a plot to kill the king. That's what we're going to do today. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I don't think that's a good idea. So that's what I'm going to do to obey the Lord. There's all this danger going on around him, but Esther, the book of Esther is teaching us that God's will is sufficient for us. And not only is it sufficient for us, like, okay, I'm just going to hunker down and I'm going to hide out here and hopefully nothing bad happens to me. It teaches us that we can be brave because we know God's confirming the work of our hands and God is protecting us even when we mess up, even when we fail and make bad decisions, it's still the Lord who's doing that. So is scripture afraid of what life is really like? No, I don't think so at all. I think scripture in the book of Esther, as we're going to continue to read, it lays out exactly what life is like and says, you know what? God's still the king over all this. God's, God, God knows the situation that you're in. God knows uniquely to you. God knows better than you know, right? Maybe you've told the horrible situation to somebody that's close to you, and yeah, you're giving your perspective on it, but God knows what it's really like more than you do. And he's saying, hey, if you trust me, I'm going to put you in a situation where you're going to be able to glorify me in a way that you never would have had the possibility to do if you hadn't have gone through this circumstance. You know, I'm going to close with this. It's really important that we be careful. Um, we can get sidetracked as Christians by universal principles. What do I mean by that? The Bible is filled with universal principles. It said, hey, is it ever a good thing to, you know, murder somebody? No. <laughs> the Bible, that's not, a, that's not a situational thing, right? Well, but in this case, Lord, no, no, it's, it's never a good thing, right? The Bible is filled with those things. But you know what the Bible also includes for us as Christians? It includes specific application. You figure out the application of how, how you know, even as I'm teaching this, I'm thinking, well, I, I can see one way and I can see another way that Esther could have acted. That's a specific situation that she got herself into that the Lord is leading her out of. And we need to trust the Lord for that, too, in our lives. Yes, there are universal principles, but, you know, as, as Christians, we're not just people who say, well, you know, here's a universal principle. Good luck with your life. Hope it applies to you somehow, because that's all I have is this vague thing. That's what the Stoics say. Right. That, and, and there's that's a big thread that's in our culture right now is stoic people coming saying, well, you know, just hopefully you have a, a, a good, OK life. It's going to be really hard, but you'll figure it out. That's not who the Lord is. God comes to our specific situation and he leads us and guides us through what we're going through. Right. And he gives us specific guidance and he says, do this and don't do that. And sometimes we don't listen to him and we say, Lord, this is really hard. So I'm going to do this third thing instead. And he gives us grace and he brings us back to the path of what he wants for us. And we need to be waiting for that from the Lord. We need to not just be saying, well, I think generally this is what everybody should do. And so, no, we need to be saying, but what is the Lord telling us to do? What is the Lord telling me to do right now? This is the way that we should be acting when we come into these situations. And guys, we are in that situation. You know, things look a lot nicer for us, right? Thankfully, there's no terrible Persian court going on where we live. But let's not kid ourselves. The world is still just as dark then, or, you know, just as dark now as it was then. In some ways, it's maybe gotten a little better. That's nice for us. But we're still in a situation where there's darkness outside and we're being called to make some actions. We're being called to take steps. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is we, if we get our eyes off of the big, and we've talked about this over and over, if we get our eyes off of the big, scary things that are going on outside and say, okay, but what does the Lord want me to do? 
Can I do that? Can I, can I, I'm going to look at my life and say, well, where is the Lord giving me access or influence? Where is the Lord giving me an opportunity? And it's going to be really scary and it's going to take the Lord's faith for me to take it. But I can do that because I know that I'm only here where I'm at in my life because the Lord has put me there. He's got a specific reason for me being in this job. He's got a specific reason for me being in my marriage or have my kids going to that school or we're on this baseball team or, or I'm leading this company or whatever it is you're doing. God, that wasn't an accident. God put me there. So God has a reason and a, and a set of things that he wants me to do. And I'm going to take hold of those and be a little brave. Sometimes it is a little scary to do, right? Well, what if I mess it up? What if people see that I'm not really as good of a, of a Christian as I, I thought I was? Trust me, they, they know that. They've already seen that, right? The Lord's grace is sufficient for you, and he wants you to go forward and obey him and please him and glorify him in that place where you're at, just like Esther was doing, even though it was a bad situation, even though there's not really a good outcome that we can see. Well, the Lord knew what the outcome was going to be. So let's be encouraged by that as we walk in the things that the Lord has for us and, and glorify him by waiting on him.